Hello, welcome back. Today we have a little bit more serious thing to discuss. So I've been hearing about this thing called the red heifer and I figured I'd research it and figure out what was going on. Well, oh my goodness. It's kind of a lot. It's kind of a big deal. And I had no idea until just this week. I had never even heard of it before. So it's recently come to my attention that um, something very interesting has happened pertaining to the three Abrahamic major faiths, and it all involves this red heifer. <clears throat> and this could potentially culminate in some really terrible things. So it doesn't bode well for humanity. Uh, no matter what faith you are, because these powerful faiths believe in this prophecy. And they have the power to move mountains, to achieve their ends without regard to the state of the world or the rest of humanity. So the Red Heifer, have you heard of this prophecy? I had not. Um... If not, I will have a full explanation of all the moving parts at the end of the video. But through research, here's what I've found so far relating to the current situation. A Christian rancher began breeding for this prophecy 20 years ago. For the prophecy. Weird. Um, in January of this year, he produced five red heifers, which held up to the scrutiny of rabbinical and prophetic requirements, of which there are many. These five heifers were then flown to a secret location in Israel to be raised until just prior to turning three years of age, when they would be assessed again for their continued purity of requirements, and if any were found to be adequate, that heifer would be sacrificed. So, no big deal. Sacrificial cow, whoop de doo right? Wrong. As the prophecy for the end times in the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim faiths all begin with the sacrifice of this red heifer, the tenth. The ninth heifer was sacrificed 2,000 years ago, and they have been searching for the tenth ever since then. Of these five red heifers that were flown from Texas to Israel, three are perfect, as in three are suitable for this sacrifice. They must be sacrificed on land which the Temple Mount can be seen from, and nine pure priests, as in a priest that has never been, never touched anything dead, must be cleansed by the heifer's sacrifice. These nine priests are ready, and the land was purchased in 2012. All of these things are in place. The cows are to be sacrificed before Passover. So that's coming up pretty quick. The situation regarding the red cows, as discussed by the Ham Ham Hamas leader, is intricately connected to current events in the Middle East. The arrival of red heifers from Texas to Israel has been linked to religious prophecies and has become a point of contention, especially with the potential implications for the Al-Aqsa Mosque that's currently on the Temple Mount, the, the big gold dome. This has added another layer to the already complex geopolitical landscape of the region. The heifers are believed by some Jewish and Christian groups to be key to rebuilding the Jewish Temple in Jerusalem a significant event in their eschatological beliefs. The Hamas leader's speech and the subsequent actions have highlighted the sensitivity around the religious symbols and their political ramifications, contributing to tensions between Israel and Palestine. Very, very complex situation. And I don't think we grasp how big a deal this really is. For a non-believer, this means nothing. But it should, because the ramifications are far-reaching and once set in motion, unavoidable, no matter what your beliefs are. These three major religions are about to set the world on fire, and they are trying to force the hand of God as far as I'm concerned. 
it is deep magic and prophecy, and we know not the outcome. I will be following this situation closely and post more videos as information comes available, but now I'll dive into the history of this prophecy. The Red Heifer, a female bovine which has never been pregnant or milked or yoked, also known as the Red Cow was a cow brought to the priests as a sacrifice according to the Torah, and its ashes were used for the ritual pur purification of corpse uncleanliness, that is, an Israelite who had come into contact with a human corpse, human bone, or grave. From the Hebrew Bible, the red heifer offering instructions are described in Numbers 19. The children of Israel were commanded to obtain a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. The heifer is then to be slaughtered and burned outside of the camp. Cedar wood, oregano, and wool or yarn dyed scarlet are added to the fire, and the remaining ashes are placed in a vessel containing pure water. In order to purify a person, who has become ritually contaminated by contact with a corpse, water from the vessel is sprinkled on them using a bunch of hyssops on the third and seventh day of the purification process. The priest who performs the ritual then becomes ritually impure and must then wash himself and his clothes in living waters. He is deemed impure until the evening. From the Mishnah, the central compilation of the Oral Torah in Rabbinic Judaism, the oral component of the written Torah, contains a tractate on the red heifer, tractate para, cow, in Seder Torahot, which explains the procedures involved. The tractate has no existing Gemara, although commentary on the procedure appears in the Gemara for other tractates of the Talmud. Details of the commandment. <clears throat> According to Mishnah Para, the presence of two black hairs invalidates a red heifer. In addition to the usual requirements of an unblemished animal for sacrifice, there are various other requirements, such as natural birth. The cesarean renders a heifer candidate invalid. The water must be living, i.e. spring water. This is a stronger requirement than for a ritual bath, mikveh. Rainwater accumulated in a cistern is permitted for a mikveh, but cannot be used in the red heifer ceremony. The Mishnah reports that in the days of the Temple of Jerusalem, water for the ritual came from the Pool of Siloam. The ceremony involved was complex and detailed to ensure the complete ritual purity of those involved. Care was taken to ensure that no one involved in the red heifer ceremony could have had any contact with the dead or any form of tuma. And implements were made of materials such as stone, which in Jewish law do not act as carriers for ritual impurities. The Mishnah recounts that children were used to draw and carry the water for the ceremony. Children born and reared in isolation for the specific purpose of ensuring that they never came into contact with a corpse. That just creeps me out. I, I don't know. <laughs> I could have a lot to say about that. There were courtyards in Jerusalem built over the virgin rock, and below them a hollow was made, lest there might be a grave in the depths and pregnant women were brought and bore their children there, and there they reared them. And oxen were brought, and on their backs were laid doors on top of which sat the children with cups of stone in their hand. When they arrived in Siloa, the children alighted and filled the cups with water and mounted and again sat on the doors. Mishnah Para 3.2 Various other devices were used, including a causeway from the Temple Mount to the Mount of Olives, so that the heifer and accompanying priests would not come into contact with a grave. According to the Mishnah, the ceremony of the, bur of the burning of the red heifer took place on the Mount of Olives, 
a ritually pure, Cohen sl slaughtered the heifer and sprinkled its blood in the direction of the temple seven times. The red heifer was then burned on a pyre, together with crimson dyed wool, hyssop, and cedar wood. In recent years, the site of the burning of the red heifer on the Mount of Olives has been tentatively located by archaeologist Yonatan Adler. Color. The heifer's color is described in the Torah as aduma, normally translated as red. However, Sandia Gowan translates the word as Judeo-Arabic um, and romanticized as safra, a word translated to English as yellow. In addition, the Quran describes Moses being commanded about a yellow cow. To explain this discrepancy, Yosef Kaif Kifa, in his Hebrew translation and commentary on Sadia's work, argues that the Bible requires the cow to have a ruddy, light brown color, which he says is the normal color of a cow. He says this color is in general described uh, in Hebrew as yellow in Arabic, resolving the discrepancy in the color words. He explains the biblical requirement to mean that the cow be entirely of this color and not have blotches or blemishes of a different color. Jewish tradition. A red heifer that conforms with all of the requirements imposed by Halakha is practically a biological anomaly. For example, the animal must be entirely of one color. A series of tests listed by the sages must be performed to ensure this and the hair of the cow must be absolutely straight to ensure that the cow has not previously been yoked, as this would be a disqualifier. According to Jewish tradition, only nine red heifers were actually slaughtered in the period extending from Moses to the destruction of the second temple. Mishnah Parah recounts them, stating that Moses prepared the first, Ezra the second, Simeon and Simeon the Just and Johanan, the high priest, prepared two each, and Elonai ben Hakayaf and Analias and Ishmael ben Fabus prepared one each. The extreme rarity of the animal, combined with the detailed ritual in which it is used, have given the red heifer special status in Jewish tradition. It is cited as the paradigm of a hawk, a biblical law for which there is no apparent logic. Because the state of ritual purity obtained through the ashes of a red heifer is a necessary prere prerequisite for participating in temple service, efforts have been made in modern times by Jews wishing for biblical ritual purity. And in anticipation of the building of the third temple to locate a red heifer and recreate the ritual. However, multiple candidates have been disqualified. <clears throat> temple Institute states, some opinions maintain that the newer ashes were always mixed together with a combination of the previous ashes. One way of understanding this is to view this mixture of old and new ashes as being yet another precautionary measure. Additionally, mixing in the newer ashes we have produced now with those from olden times is a way of connecting through time with the original heifer that was slaughtered and prepared by Moses. As such, in a sense, it is a way of connecting with the level of Moses himself. Apparently, red heifer ashes were still in use as late as the time of Jeremiah III in the 4th century. Temple Institute. Let's see. Temple Institute, the organization dedicated to preparing the reconstruction of a third temple in Jerusalem, has been attempting to identify red heifer candidates consistent with the requirements of Numbers 19, 1 through 22, and Mishnah Tractate Para 14 and 15. In recent years, the Institute thought to have identified two candidates, one in 1997 and another in 2002. The Temple Institute had initially declared both kosher, but later found each to be unsuitable. 
The Institute has been raising funds in order to use modern technology to produce a red heifer that is genetically based on the red Angus. In September 2018, the Institute announced a red heifer candidate was born saying the heifer is currently a viable candidate and will be examined to see whether it possesses the necessary qualifications for the red heifer. In September 2022, five red cows were imported from the United States and transferred to a breeding farm in Israel. According to the rabbis who accompanied the process, the cows are kosher for sacrifice. Quran. The second and the longest surah chapter in the Quran is named Al-Baqarah, the cow or the heifer. After the heifer, as the commandment is related in the surah. And when Moses said unto his people, Lo, Allah, commandeth you that ye sacrifice a cow, they said, dost thou make game of us? He answered, Allah forbid that I should be among the foolish. They said, Pray for us unto thy Lord, that he make clear to us what cow she is. Moses answered, Lo, he saith verily, she is a cow neither with calf nor immature. She is between the two conditions. So do that which ye are commanded. They said, Pray for us unto thy Lord, that he make clear to us of what color she is. Moses answered, Lo, he saith, Verily she is a yellow cow. Bright is her color, gladdening beholders. They said, Pray for us unto thy Lord, that he make clear to us what cow she is. Lo, cows are much alike to us, and lo, if Allah wills, we may be led aright. Moses answered, Lo, he saith, verily she is a cow unyoked. She ploweth not the soil, soil nor watereth the tilth, whole and without marked. They said, Now thou bringest the truth. So they sacrificed her, though almost they did not. Quran, Surah 2 Ibn Kathir explains that according to Ibn Abbas and Ubaida Ibn al-Harith, it displayed the stubbornness of the children of Israel, who asked unnecessary questions to the prophets without readily following any commandment from God. They had slaughtered a cow, any cow, it would have been sufficient for them. But instead, as they made the matter more difficult, God made it more difficult for them. Christian Tradition The non-canonical Epistle of Barnabas explicitly equates the red heifer with Jesus. In the New Testament, the phrases without the gate, Hebrews 13.12, and without the camp, Numbers 19.3, Hebrews 13.13, 13, have been taken to be not only an identification of Jesus with the red heifer, but an indication as to the location of the crucifixion. All right, so that's a description. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure about all of this. I'm still looking into it. I'm trying to find out more. There is a lot more information. Uh, this is kind of a deep, a deep issue, and it's a very serious issue. And I felt like I needed to make a video on it because um, the date for sacrifice of this guy is coming up. And no matter what your beliefs or no matter what you think is true or not true, that's neither here nor there because billions of people around the world believe this. And it's literally... Christians have united with, which is hilarious to me, the Christians have united with the Jewish people to make this happen because they want to force the second coming. Um, the Jewish people want to make this happen because they want to rebuild the temple and they want for the first coming, the Messiah to come. And the Jewish people believe that all Gentiles will be their servants and slaves after this happens. And Christian people believe that the Jewish people will either accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior or be killed. So they're, but they're going to help each other. Those groups are going to help each other. 
And it just seems so crazy to me. So, okay, whatever. That's a little crazy. But what's really, really crazy and scary is that they're going to destroy or attempt to destroy this major site that is a major site for all three of these religions uh, in order to build, rebuild their third temple. And the Muslims are going to, it's going to be a massive, bloody, horrifying battle. Once that heifer is sacrificed, there is no going back as far as any of these three groups are concerned. And I'm really afraid for people after that happens. So I'm going to keep a close eye on this. And if I get any more information or if I learn more, I will post more. But uh, thank you again. And I hope that this was insightful. Uh, definitely look into it. There are some really good YouTube videos. I watched some of those to kind of get myself caught up. So there are some really great YouTube videos out about this. So watch them all. Thank you. Have a good day.